Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It is officially day four of our virtual success week. You are currently tuned into the session, learning how to navigate under COVID, understanding stress, anxiety, and learning how to adapt to a changing environment. And I personally am super excited for this one. Um, I definitely need some tips on um, how to navigate my changing environment because I'm still getting used to everything. So we wanted to welcome you to this session, let you know that as an attendee viewing live, you are muted upon entry, but we want you to feel comfortable asking any questions. You can raise your hand or you can type your question into the chat. We will be monitoring that um, throughout the live session. Um, if you're watching this as a recording, if you end up having questions, you can certainly reach out to myself or one of our um, panelists uh, after the fact. So. That being said, this session will be recorded for those who are unable to join us. So um, without further ado, I will introduce our panelists for um, this session, learning how to navigate under COVID. Hi, my name is Sue Dietrich. I, along with Renee Kalecki, are going to be talking about how you can navigate under COVID conditions and how to navigate and find some useful understanding of dealing with our stress and anxiety. And I so welcome. And I think we're going to maybe take these off now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think it's a good idea. And I think we look a little scary with them on and it's, um, you know, it's very itchy and um, uh, uncomfortable and it's hard to hear. So that's just the start of our adapting to COVID. Um, but we also just want to remind you to wear your mask in public so we can all stay healthy. Yeah, I'm going to oh. share our screen. If you can give me a moment to get there. So Sue and I uh, work in counseling. We are both professional clinical counselors licensed in the state of Ohio. And uh, Sue has been at Western Campus for several years and then now is at the Metro Campus. And I'm uh, at Western Campus and have been there for uh, about two and a half years. And we are excited to talk to you about this uh, presentation today because it's something that's affecting everybody. We can't get away from it. And uh, it has its ups and downs. So we'd like to talk to you about that. So welcome. Thank you. And can you guys see the screen okay, just as we're starting? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> I am not seeing it, but okay. I'm sure that we have. Give me a second to fix that little issue. So while she's doing that, I think Megan has a song prepared. Oh. <laughs> yes. I just certainly do. I take requests all Disney all the time. Okay. Um, okay. So there should be a little icon down in the bottom that said, oh, there we go. I got to get to the Great. right page. So give me a moment here. Gotcha. There we go. Fortunately, you guys Megan didn't has been saved me. by the icon. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. All right. I'm going to skip. <laughs> so, um, you know, our title is kind of long, but I, I think part of that is we just have a lot to talk about in this time. Um, so we're going to share some information on uh, on how people do respond physically, emotionally, behaviorally, and how we connect to those things with the research that we have about the brain and, and how our reactions are really pretty normal for having going under this huge pandemic situation. So we are going to talk to you about security versus insecurity, COVID-19, the impact it's had on all of us. I mean, really, six months ago, we hadn't heard of that term. It was, it was a nothing, you know? It, 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 and now it's part of our everyday conversation. Um, how do we experience stress and anxiety with changes in our, our environment like this? Um, how we respond when we feel stress and how that's connected to the brain. Um, how we can recognize our own triggers what are the things that are going to make us anxious and, and uncomfortable? How can we have good self-care? How can we strengthen ourselves and, and become resilient through self-care? 
and, and some ways to do that with routines, rituals, and resources. So the three R's, well, five R's there, six. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit that. And I got the signal. <laughs> That works very well. <laughs> We're also going to ask for some input down the uh, throughout the presentation. So, um, you know, if there are any questions, we'll probably do that through chat, and we'll be glad to have your input uh, a little bit later. So, today we're going to talk about just kind of the foundation and how we got to this point with COVID. Not not about COVID itself, but our response to it. And part of it is that um, structure gives us security. And what that means is that when we have a structure in place, when we have a schedule, when we have uh, some way of knowing what's going to happen next, it, it makes us feel somewhat secure. And that is because we can predict what's happening. And when we can predict what's happening, we don't need as many of our internal personal resources to adapt to that environment. So when we have a new event or something that we cannot predict, we have to uh, use our brain power. We have to go deep into history and, and personal experience and things that we may have learned to try to know how to act in that situation. So if you can think about some examples of structure giving us a sense of security. Um, when you go into your first class of a, a new class in college, you know, there might be some excitement, there might be some dismay, there might be some fear or, or just a little bit of low level anxiety. How is this class going to be? Will I know anyone in the class? How will the professor be? Where should I sit? Uh, will I, am I there on time? Am I in the right room? Oh my gosh, I'm in the wrong side of the building. Where should I go? I'm going to be late. So. If we, that, that's kind of that first day, and I'm trying to conjure up a little bit of anxiety in you, <laughs> um, not to make you uncomfortable, but just to sort of experience that, to think about what that feels like when you're in a new situation. If you're going on a first date with someone, if you have a job interview or the first day of a new job, um, what will I do? Will people talk to me? Will I be able to manage the workload? Will they think I'm uh, competent? Will they think I'm not? You know, people, these are common worries. And when we have that, we feel a little bit of anxiety because we can't predict what's going to happen. However, when we can, when we have structure, when we can predict what's going to happen, we are able to feel a little more comfortable. So if we know our schedule at school, we know where the classes are, a lot of times we'll recommend that students take their schedule and uh, you know, go around the building and figure out where things are so that they know where to go on that first day of school. Um, and also a work schedule. If you just every day have to decide, do I wonder if I work today, is today a work day? That would be kind of anxiety producing because we can't plan for anything else. So having a schedule, having something predictable helps us. The syllabus tells us what the assignments are. We don't have to guess. We don't have to wonder about what to do today. Um, it, it gives us a sense of control and sometimes no structure or it get, when we can't predict what's going to happen makes us feel out of control. And again, those feelings of anxiety sort of on a continuum, we might have a little, it might grow, it might grow into a lot, uh, can be a part of our our psyche in that moment, and then that can help us to uh, not be well in our environment. So keep in mind that if we can predict our environment, if we can have some sense of predictability, it gives us a sense of stability. It makes us feel calmer inside. I know what to do in this situation. I know how to act. I know where to go. I'm not going to be lost. I, I, I've got this, basically. And we know that we can't control every situation. We can't predict every situation because life happens and things get in the way. However, um, if we still have that basic structure, it gives us the ability to deal with the new things that happen. Unpredictability, uncertainty. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what happens next. I don't know how to respond in this environment when I don't know what to do. Um, so I, I think that that brings about those feelings of anxiety and it might be more heightened and anxiety could, we're going to talk more about that. We're not going to go into that now. There's lots of 
uh, anxiety uh, information that we'll present to you a little bit later. And so with uncertainty and COVID, what does that mean for us? Because that has brought about a lot of uncertainty. And if we think back to March, when we started hearing about it, maybe the end of February, beginning of March, and it was far away, right? It was in China. It, then it made its way to Seattle. And maybe our anxiety started to grow a little bit. Now, this is something that could actually impact me or somebody I know. And then we had three cases here in Ohio. And um, I, I remember back to mid-March, you know, it was spring break when, when we started to get more information about how this is going to impact us directly. When most of us, many of you were um, not even thinking about school yet because you were on spring break and, and those of us who were working had to start thinking about how we were going to work remotely. It brought about a lot of questions, unknowns, unsureness. And for us at work, it was very uh, a lot of unknown. How will we be able to, to continue to serve our students? What's going to happen? But on a personal level, that was also scary and unknown. You know, is this something that can impact me personally? Could I get sick? What about my, my elderly mother, my father, my grandparents, what, whoever is in your life? And yes, it is about a lot of older people, but now we're hearing about younger people too. And so it brought about a lot of questions and unsureness and what's going to happen. Some of us were lucky enough to be able to work from home. Many people lost their jobs. And so we didn't have that predictability. We didn't have that way of saying, I know what's going to happen next for the foreseeable future. I know I'm gonna get up and go to work I know I'll go to school and have my classes. That was all taken away, you know, like the rug being pulled out from under us. That's kind of an old saying, and um, it, you can kind of get that feeling. You know, everything, when you pull out the rug, everything just goes flying, and it's going to land in different spots. And so our ground is shaken up a little bit. You know, it's not what we, uh, what we know. Everything's in a different place. Okay, I'm going to work, but, but am I going to be able to do this from home? I'm not going to be able to work. How am I going to continue to support my family? And how are my classes going to go? I'm, I'm not sure if I can do this online business. So that predictability was taken away. And so our anxiety started to creep up. And now we can't go out. We can't go to the coffee shop. We can't go shopping. How are we going to get food? And God knows we need that toilet paper, right? So, you know, those have brought about so many questions and fears because everybody was was responding in a way that suggested that they didn't know what to do either, you know? And, and I think that's the thing. If, if we have a situation that causes fear and anxiety because it's unknown, we can sort of rely on a, a, a past experience. You know, okay, I have a new class, but last semester I had a new class and I made new friends and I got comfortable. We can build on past experience. Or we can go to someone who's comforting and who will say, it's going to be all right. You're going to be okay. I share this example. It sounds really silly, but my, one of my biggest fears is thunderstorms. And, um, you know, in, at this age, I am so fearful. And so um, when I've had, you know, my parents or spouse be able to tell me, you know, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You're going to survive this. The house is Dirty, you know, you're not going to get hit by lightning. Just stay off the roof with your golf club and your foot in a pail of water. You should be all right. But when I'm by myself and I don't have anybody to say that, I, I'm real scared, you know, and I think COVID is like that. We don't have anyone to say, hey, people, it's going to be okay because it's new for everybody. And worldwide, we've been impacted by it. You know, every country pretty much has been impacted by COVID. And it's new and it's scary and, and and I'm not trying to increase your anxiety now, but I realize I should be doing this. So I hope well, I'm going to take a deep breath. Come on. Renee, if I can add too that it's contagious. It's very contagious. So someone's yeah. fear is contagious and it causes people to feel that fear even if they weren't experiencing that level initially. Right. Right. And you know, and that's the truth. You can see it in people's faces. I don't know how that was for you to see Sue and um, me wearing our masks, but I mean, it's a little unsettling. Like, who's behind that mask, right? Um, and, and what do they look like? And if we're seeing people on the streets or 
as in some meme I saw going into a bank with a mask on. I mean, those things are a little unsettling. Um, so I, I think everyday life has been altered for everybody, for everyone. And there are very few people who are not touched by it in some way. And, um, and so, you know, we're looking for somebody to say it's going to be okay. And again, that, that contagion of fear and the disease itself, so it, it's like the, the, the disease is contagious um, and the fear of the unknown and the fear of the disease are, are both contagious. And um, we're afraid for ourselves, you know, what's this going to mean for me? What's it going to mean for my loved ones and my friends and, and my colleagues, which are also loved ones, of course. But, but I, I think that we're worried about our health, we're worried about our safety. Um, certainly, you know, we've been concerned because of all the tension that it's caused. And, and now we're, we've got other issues that are, are part of that landscape um, where fear is, is very prevalent. And again, because it's unknown, what will people do if they don't have their toilet paper? Is there going to be, you know, mass hysteria? Um, and, and again, for our, our, the safety of our loved ones. I have an elderly mom. I was worried about going to visit her, but she had health issues. I was worried about not going to visit her. You know, it, it's how do we make those decisions under all of this information, which is changing and, um, and, and sometimes just different from other information that we received earlier. So fear, I think we all can experience that or, or understand what that is feeling is. So another impact of COVID is the social isolation and overcrowding. So it's sort of like two sides of the same coin. I mean, we are, are isolated in a way from our larger environment. We're not going to work. We're not seeing the, the you know, the barista at our local coffee shop that we see every single day or the gas station attendant or all the people that we are part of our regular day-to-day -day life, you know, who are, are part of the weave of, of our fabrics. And it, it, it's a little bit unsettling not to see those people. How are they? Are, are they safe? Um, but they make me feel good to see them, and I can't see them. And I'm now by myself, because many people are, are by themselves, socially isolated in their own homes, um, but not able to reach out and, and see people that bring them comfort or joy or just some sense of normalcy or regularity. Um, and then there's the opposite, too. Not the opposite. It's, it's the other side of the coin. It's where there are many people at home. You know, college kids had to come home. Maybe people are laid off and they're, or they're working from home. So the regular day-to-day -day is, is not the same for people. Um, there may be many people living in a home and, and as much as you may love your family it might be kind of annoying because now it's noisier or there was you know your your privacy is encroached upon um and you know for, in many families it depends on how you think about home too so if you can kind of reflect on that for a moment you know what what is the feeling that you associate with home so for some people it's, it's wow that's my sanctuary it's like sitting around the fireplace, eating popcorn and drinking cocoa. And, and, and for other people, it's like, that's where I go because I have to be somewhere. Um, but my real life begins when I leave home, you know, my job, my school, my friends, uh, riding my bike, uh, whatever it is that brings joy and, and comfort and that sense of regularity. So sometimes home is where you have to be, but it might not feel like that safe refuge. So it, for some it might, and for some it may not. And it may not be desirable to be at home, and um, and that's troubling because when you can't go out, you know, when you can't be at home, and you ha and you have to be, that can be unsettling, troublesome, anxiety-producing, depression-producing. The people who are isolated by themselves might feel um, okay. Maybe sometimes being out is more frightening if people are more on the introverted scale, and it may feel like, wow, I feel pretty safe here. But for those who, for being alone, is, is tough and, and they need the support of others, um, that can create more anxiety or depression or exacerbate what's already there. So that's a, a huge impact of COVID that we probably never gave a whole lot of thought for before, um, at least not on such a big scale. I mean, if we're, you know, if we're homebound because of a blizzard, 
um, it's one thing, but, but this is different. We don't know when the blizzard is going to end in this situation. And um, so, so to add on to your yeah. piece, Renee, about it, home not feeling safe, mm -hmm. um, that it could be very, you know, some of our situations may be very unsafe where where we may have unhealthy or on, you know, violent or um, environments that we can't cope with very easily when we're at home for long lengths of time. So just the impact of COVID and, yeah. and limiting us on our options. Well, I think that's really true. And I, I you know, I'm not to spend a lot of time on it, but I, I think it, it fits with that predictability and unpredictability. Um, and, and for people who maybe are struggling with mental illness or, or substance abuse, or um, if there's some violence in the home in some way, um, for our family members of those people, I, I, I think we now have an unpredictable environment. And, and so that can increase tension. And again, more people in the home or isolation. Um, and that can make situations dangerous. And then when you don't have the outlet, um, of, of going to school or to work where you might feel safe, where you can either confide in someone or just have that time away, um, which also lessens the tension for people at home. Um, it, it can make things volatile. And, um, and I, I think um, that that can be very anxiety producing, obviously. I mean, that's, you know, that's just part of it. And we want people to be safe and certainly to be able to reach out um, if they are not safe. And, and that's, that's important too, to be able to reach out to us, to the police, to anybody that might be a comfort to you. Thank you, that, that's a huge part. That is very important. And uh, you know, another part of the changes of COVID are the losses that we're experiencing. We're, you know, we're, we lose that, we've lost the predictability. We've lost our daily routines. Um, socialization has, has not been the same. How many of you have done those Zoom meetings with your friends or family? You know, that, it, it's one way of connecting, like we are today. Um, it, it's probably not the same. It's just less spontaneous, maybe, and, uh, you know, there's a time limit, and um, it's a good way. It's, it's much better than just talking on the phone, I think, because we can see that person, and that can bring comfort. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not the same as, as hanging out with your friends. Um, the loss of jobs, income, or the fear of loss of jobs. I mean, certainly, you know, it, it, everybody's been impacted by that. Um, the economy, you know, the trust in the economy that was growing. It's like we hear these dire reports every day. What does that mean for me? Does that mean our jobs will be eliminated? Um, who's going to be hiring? And uh, what about unemployment? And, and what about being able to afford the life I was living uh, before? before March of 2000, or 2020, rather. Um, school, and, and that's been a big loss for a lot of people. And, you know, for those of you who uh, have continued with your classes online, I, I give you a lot of credit. I think it's been a challenge for a lot of the students with whom we've spoken to over the, the past month. And um, that sudden switch to online with no choice in the matter. You know, many people yeah. choose to do online classes, give it a try, and and see what that's like. But I think that people have missed the classroom environment and, um, and also maybe have struggled with uh, being able to manage the online workload. Um, and, and so some people have, have you know, dropped some classes and some people have spent a lot of time worrying about their ability to, to continue to do well, um, which we, we hope for everybody. We want you to continue and we want you to succeed. Um, but, but I think period people have felt losses about their schooling. Um, losses about plans, just what are, you know, what's the future hold for me? And, and with all of that can be a loss of motivation and, and that desire to get up every day and get going. So, you know, what we've talked about so far is how a change in the environment and for everybody in this situation, it can be uh, equivalent to stress or a, and, and that change in itself is a stressor. And stress is really, um, it's not inside of us necessarily, it's how we respond to change is what stress is. And it, it's like a, a new invader um, in a negative way, but or just something new in our environment and, and um, is, is what a change is, but that also creates stress. 
And it, it's interesting because there's some research recently about how stress and excitement are in the same continuum. And that the physical feelings that we feel when we are um, excited about something, like we're going to a concert and it's about to get started and we've been looking forward to it, and what we feel when we're anxious are the same physical changes in our body, the same physiological events. It's just kind of the context that creates excitement or anxiety. So, you know, sometimes the holiday time is really a stressor for people, where for some people it's exciting. Um, but it, it's all of that same response. Our heart's pounding, our breath is changing, we might feel a little queasy. Um, and speaking of those feelings, what do you feel when you look at that photo of people jumping out of the, the, an airplane, ostensibly, without a parachute? Well, they have parachutes, they just didn't open them. Um, but, but in that moment, we don't see the parachute. So think about that for a moment. And um, just want you, because we're going to ask you to talk a little bit in a second, but just want to kind of get an idea of what that feels like to you when you, you, what would that feel like to jump out of the plane and not have your parachute open yet? It's like a free fall, right? You, you know, I can feel my stomach already. Like, oh, it doesn't feel so good. It's a little scary. Um, we, we think we have a parachute, but we don't really know. But it, it's going to, because our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors are all interrelated, each one affects the other. So it does, jumping out of a plane or, or having a, an event like COVID um, does affect our outlook, how we look at life coming up, our expectation, our abilities to cope, and our confidence. All of those things are all interconnected. So if we are fearful and if we're feeling anxiety, we're going to act in a certain way in response to it. Our bodies react, like I said, we get that queasy feeling in our stomach, our hearts are racing, our breath becomes shallow, and, and we want to quiet that down. And there are many healthy ways to do that. But one behavioral way that, that sometimes people turn to is maybe um, bringing something in to to quiet down all those feelings. So, you know, maybe drinking too much, eating too much, sleeping too much, um, playing too many video games, that excess of uh, external um, things, <laughs> I can't think of a better word, to bring in to calm down that feeling of jumping out of an airplane with, without the parachute opening yet. So, and those things aren't healthy and, and they can lead to more anxiety and, and more difficulty and functioning in our, our daily life. So again, keep in mind our mood, our thoughts, and our, our behavior or reactions are interconnected. And um, just to add on that, Renee, sometimes mm -hmm. our anxiety and stress isn't doesn't show up like worry or anxiousness. It may show up as aggressiveness or yeah. acting out or, you know, in other ways that don't always speak so directly to stress and anxiety. So it's really important to recognize that behavior in general, like um, Renee said, is important to look at and and how to realize, well, maybe this this is a level of anxiety or stress as well. That's a good point. And I, I think paying attention to that whole uh, spectrum of emotions and anger. I mean, how, has anyone not felt a little irritable or angry at all since March at, at times? And, and that's and it doesn't happen for everybody, but for some people, you're right, too. It does come out as, you know, just agitated. And I, I, I'm just short with everybody. I want to bite somebody's head off. Not I mean, literally. A, We're not going to do that. A lot of small businesses that are in concerning positions right now where maybe the owners are feeling stressed, but it may come out in in ways that are more angry, you know, angry at the economy, angry at the government, all those things. <laughs> okay. So, um, to put this slide together, this is my favorite of the, the whole presentation, I think. Uh, but what does COVID look like for you? So, if anybody wants to participate, just in the chat, that would be great. How has COVID impacted your life? Is it like looking in the mirror when you see those little puppies with their mouths? Um, and you don't have to share, but we really invite you to. Um, Think about how COVID has um, affected
affected your life, and it may have been in a positive way. I feel like we're kind of talking in, in the negative here because but that's what we're addressing. But I'd like to hear too, you know, what, what good has come from COVID in your life? Anyone, right. do you have any? Megan? <laughs> okay, so. Megan says a positive gets to spend more time with her new baby. Oh, yeah. That's good, right? You wouldn't think of that kind of positive when you're thinking of COVID. Um, I guess I can add to that too. Um, I have uh, graduating, graduated a senior in college this year and my daughter came home for two months. Probably wasn't her ideal situation, but it was so nice to have her home and probably an opportunity that'll um, never happen again, you know, unusual, but definitely helped us connect and um, having a lot of fun during that time. Anyone else have any comments? I, I feel like I've been able to, you know, exercise more regularly. And that my excuse had always been I was too tired from the drive to work or drive home from work or um, it just, you know, just too much of the day. And, and so I have no excuse now. So uh, I, I spent more time trying to work out, you know, getting outside more. Um, and also just not having that commute. I've saved on gas and, and not being in the uh, rush hour has been somewhat pleasant. Right. So some other comments are, um, Damien says, you know, similar, I think, to what I had said, many friends and I mean, um, able to strengthen family relationship with a loved one, um, as well as a negative, many friends and family lost their jobs. And that's frightening and scary to watch other people um, go through those kind of losses. And then you worry about what's going to happen to them next. Okay, well, then I think if no one else has anything right now, um, but feel free to use that chat and then we will retrieve that as we go through this. Um, so into understanding COVID, we kind of want to move to, if I can do this, to understanding what happens when we have stress and our own stress response. So I'm going to kind of move to maybe if I could figure out using the little um, laser, Got it. Uh, maybe, <laughs> give me a minute. Otherwise, uh, we can do it without if I can't figure it out, but um, maybe up here. Huh. Well, I, I did see it initially. I did see it initially. Well, and that's okay. So I'm just going to kind of walk you guys through it. Using this little graph, I'm trying to demonstrate our stress response system. We all have it in the stress response system that gets activated, whether it's COVID or pre-COVID. It's, it's built into our body. It's the fight or flight system. It's a physiological reaction that we have in the face of some kind of threat or fear. Um, and whether it's really threatening or not, it's how we see it. Um, and basically what happens is, if I could show you here, I could probably show you with a pen maybe, I guess, yeah, is if you just look at how these arrows go up, this bottom level here is kind of our calm alert level. And as we climb here, the, the um, arrows just represent how our cortisol level, we're flooded with cortisol hormones helping us handle whatever that fearful threatening situation is and then after the um oops we don't want to write all over it but after the threatening situation then we then we actually go on down and our cortisol levels come come back to more of a normal stage so an example might be on a normal day maybe you're rushing around and you're trying to get to school you're trying to balance work and uh, school and you're late and you're trying to find a parking space, your stress response may, may be activated. Or if you have a test that you've studied for and you don't feel comfortable or prepared, you could feel that sense of not just anxiety, but that stress response 
in action. So that it happens to all of us. Is, Go ahead. Oh, just that the cortisol is that uh, kind of chemical transmitter that that tells our body that it, it, we are in an alarm situation. So all those things we mentioned about that heart rate and the stomach distress and the breathing and maybe muscle tension. When Sue was talking about the physiological response of cortisol, when that is increased in our bodies, that's what it does to our bodies. It, it does all those fancy things that make us feel a, a, a little discomfort. So in the normal day, we may not even realize sometimes that our stress response is activated and that this fight or flight is activated. Um, and sometimes maybe for some of us, it's become so normal that we kind of live in more of this stressed response. Um, the idea though too is our bodies may have the ability to go back to our normal alert calm self. Um, and they do say that it takes about 20 to 60 minutes sometimes for that stress response to get to that um, pre-arousal level. But sometimes we we may need more support and help to take care of ourselves because what happens and let me get out of this there um what happens is it can stay jammed on that stress response can stay jammed on where we're easily activated and it's like an alarm that's going off we don't even always know that that's what's taking place but that's what can happen to some of us if we don't use um you know, we don't use techniques that help our self care, that use strategies to bring those kind of symptoms down. It can lead to chronic stress, but it can also lead to other health issues too if it's unattended. So, you know, this kind of brings us to understanding too how important it is to pay attention to what that represents and, and understanding and developing coping strategies. Um, so, even though I kind of mentioned just some everyday. Um, stress situations, now we have COVID. And now you may be informed, maybe in a matter of weeks, that you lost your job, you lost your business. I don't know why that did that. Um, you know, you you're losing a lot of things, or you're 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 now finding yourself home in a crowded home with lots of extra responsibilities like teaching your kids how to do or in third grade or to and balance all this and your normal level of coping strategies and abilities are stretched okay so in understanding that i want to kind of move to understanding stress and that response but how the brain responds to this stress it actually stress actually affects and can change how your brain reacts so Stick with me because I'm, I might go through a couple layers here. In this particular um, graph, you're gonna see the thinking part of the brain. It's in the green here, okay? And just to give a little um, clarity about it, it's the upper part of your brain. It's the, the upstairs part of your brain. It's the part of your brain that we use to um, do well in school. It is It helps us um, be attentive, to concentrate, to um, have the ability for abstract thinking, to be analytical. It allows us for creativity, um, to be flexible, because lots of times we need to be flexible. And if you notice in this um, graph, on the right-hand side, identifies a person's IQ. You'll notice a higher level of IQ in the calm and alert stage, like right on this right-hand side. And that kind of is telling into how well we're operating, okay? And and that we can do our best thinking. And obviously when our IQ is, is at a higher level, the thinking part of the brain is the way we solve problems, how we make decisions, how if we are upset or we have a difficult situation, how we not just solve that problem, but maybe do what we need to do to take care of ourselves. So, and this this is huge whether we're talking um being a student being working it it helps us control um how we manage ourselves and and how we do well 
But if you look at the bottom part of this, you will see the red and the pink. And this is the primitive part of our brain or what they may call downstairs part of our brain. It is the lower level part of our brain. It's the part of the brain that was developed earliest. And it's also where that fight or flight lives. It's where that stress response system lives, okay? You'll notice when we look at the state, you'll see alarmed, afraid. And what I would even include in there is when we're more anxious, when we're overwhelmed, okay? So now you'll, the kind of thinking that takes place when we're in this part of our brain, we are more reactive, we're more regressive, we may find ourselves acting like a child sometimes. I think all of us could probably account for that, you know, those times when maybe with a loved one, we had, you know, an argument and we may have been upset and said things that were immature or um, childish, you know, really in, you know, wanting things and then realizing after we calmed down and our brain was in a, a calmer state that we were regretful of how we reacted. But basically that alarm afraid state is, is like the reactiveness, we're impulsive, um, quick to react. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones that kind of spoke to it. Oh, this is really important too, is when we're more in that alarmed afraid state, we're more zoned in on right now, right here. That's their time frame versus the thinking part of the brain, we have the ability to look down in the future, okay? So it definitely limits us quite a bit. Um, so keep this in mind as we move on and understanding one other piece of this puzzle, okay? So this is two different graphs. You'll notice on the left side is when we're more regulated. That's the one when we're more alert. Um, it was that upper part of the thinking brain that we talked about. And I really just want you to look mostly at the top of this, which is the um, neocortex, which is in blue, the limbic, which is in green, you know? And basically the neocortex is that thinking part of the brain that calls the shots, the decision maker, and the limbic is where your fight or fight lives, okay? It's where you're reactive. It's when you feel threatened. And basically you'll see, even though it doesn't look like it's a lot bigger, the neocortex or the thinking part of the brain is still calling the shots, helping when you're upset and you and you need to have a, co a difficult conversation. If you feel overwhelmed, it allows you to say, you know what, I'm going to take a break first. It gives you that ability when that part of your brain is is illuminated, is in charge versus on the right hand side here, your neocortex or your upstairs part of your brain is smaller. It's not it's not as in charge in your limbic system, which is in green, is more dictating the shots. It's that fight or flight that's reacting and, and possibly quickly. You know, if we're not taking care of ourselves, that's getting activated quite a bit quicker. So I'm only going to say I know I got to move forward here and really looking at one little analogy with this one upstairs brain, downstairs brain in um, teaching kids about the brain, um, I thought this was helpful in understanding that your upstairs part of your brain is the wise owl. That's where your thinking part of your brain, where you make all your good decisions is. And your lower part of your brain is the barking dog, where you make quick reactions, just like a dog would if he if he sees a, a bike go by or a truck go by, he reacts right away. If we, the wise owl flies away when the barking dog is in charge. It's when that lower part of your brain is making all the decisions. And obviously no one wants that, but it's it's good to understand the awareness of what's playing out in effect of our brain. And so that's the other side of this for us as we move forward is knowing knowing yourself, learning what is my stress like? You know, do I react? Do I get irritated? Do I fly off the handle? Do I um, shut myself alone in my room? Um, what are those little things that tell you, this is what I'm doing right now? Sometimes we don't know, and it takes some effort to get in tune to understand ourselves and to be reflective of that. Um, but it is important 
to get a sense of am I, I always like to think of a, on a scale of one to 10 and think of is my irritation, you know, if I'm irritated, I'm at a level three or four. If I'm, um, you know, closing the doors on people, slamming doors in my house, maybe I'm a five. Um, and then if I'm an eight or a nine, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being unreasonable with everybody. So how to know and pay attention when you're a three or a four, so you don't overflow. So it's not a fire. It, it's just a small little flame that you can handle and you can do something about. And, and just another piece on that is understanding your personal history. We all have personal history. Some of, a, some of our history affects us greater than others, but it's important. We can't look at those things and how our anxiety is playing out if we also don't notice if our personal history gets in the way and exasperates our level of anxiety or stress. You know, like maybe if, if you have a history of um, substance abuse in your family or with yourself, and how that may be exasperated or those concerns may be exasperated at times like this. Or if you've, you know, you've lived and you've had a history of bullying and relationships could be hard and to trust people. So kind of pulling this all together and understanding how, how do you pay attention to where you're at so that you can make some different choices on gaining some control you know, during COVID and beyond. Um, getting back in balance. How do you stay ahead of stress? And staying ahead of stress is all about how do I protect myself? You know, a, a big word used in mental health is um, resilience. Resilience is the, bil the ability to bounce back, bounce back and really bounce back and, and kind of get on track. So you're not too far off track of, of where you were before you were stressed, but understanding um, things that you can put in place to give yourself a cushion or you know like a savings account so that when you're feeling overwhelmed or you're feeling those things, you, you can just pull out of your toolbox, you have some resources or options to kind of bring yourself down or to, to help yourself feel better. So part of that is how do I stay tuned in to knowing what my triggers are, what my things are. Um, I do think I get, you know, I'll say for myself, um, I get short with people when I'm um, irritated and I'm not liking, you know, how a situation's going down. And so I start to bark a little bit and, and not as kind as I would like to be. Um, you know, for another person, they might just um, close themselves off in a room and that's what they need to do to kind of regroup. It's not always a good thing. Sometimes if they, you know, continue to do that and nothing gets resolved. But in this discussion, it's how do you notice? How do you know what your triggers are? And if you don't, how do you discover them? So how do you discover what your triggers are, but what to do about it? So an, an important answer, and some of this is not new to you guys, is how to reset and take a break. How to refuel and re-energize. When we looked at that graph of how your stress response works, how to bring yourself down to your calm state. Um, lots of times, physical exercise is awesome. It doesn't have to be exercise. Like I am not one to go to the gym per se, but I do like that physical energy, you know, whether it's hiking or biking. Some people like taking a walk, getting out in nature. I mean, it, that's still physical. Getting a change of scenery is a really nice thing. Meditation. Those things have been proven to increase our um, positive, our positive hormones in our body, you know. Um, Socially, same thing with socially. You might say, okay, well, I'm weary about going out because some of my friends, they aren't weary about going out and they're not going to be respectful of, of social distancing, but even different ways to have that connection. You know, how do you keep your boundary and say, I need that six feet apart? How do you have phone conversations or Zoom calls? Or maybe I think we're finding now there are opportunities to take a safe if we feel we are comfortable doing that. Um, 
so there are still safe distancing mindset though just thinking about mindset mindset is paying attention to your internal dialogue thinking of the pattern of how you think about things is it positive is it negative earlier renee was talking about concerns people have with covid and those things there was a lot of what if this happens what if this happens those are common phrases to pay attention to that lend itself. Those are okay questions initially, but good for you to know that that actually kind of exasperates catastrophizing, um, thinking the worst of a situation. And maybe at that moment, that's how you felt, but it's how to kind of pay attention to that. Are you, are your words, are your messages to yourself soothing and encouraging or are they self-critical or discouraging or hopeless? It's really important to pay attention to what they sound like. Sometimes um, we get caught in black and white thinking. It's either all good or it's all bad. You know, either, you know, I'm never gonna get a job again or um, it, it's awesome. And sometimes we could get caught in that trap where it's hard to unravel and get out. Mindset can really have a ripple effect a snowball effect on other thoughts where we just continue down this road and we get caught in a rabbit hole of, of things being bad and, and we're not gonna get out of it. So positive versus negative. Um, lastly, boundaries. So if, if, oh, go ahead. Just to, um, to add to that, I, I think that sometimes those thoughts are so automatic, they pop into our heads. It mm -hmm. almost feels like it's not even ourselves thinking them, but somebody's injecting those thoughts. What if I don't get a job? What if I get sick? And so one thing is if, if those thoughts come up, it's to say, and I will be okay. And I will be okay to provide a soothing thought with that negative thought, because you're right, that, that rabbit hole is pretty dark. And, um, so how can we shine some light on it? And we can, that, that is a coping skill of, um, I will get through it. I will lean on my support. I will find my resources. I will be okay. I think it's it's being aware of this, like kind of getting a sense of where you are. That's a good point about it being very automatic, you know, like it just becomes your default setting. Um, also boundaries, just like I think we have to take extra note of boundaries these days. Typically, I would even say on a, you know, any kind of talk like this and talking about coping strategies, boundaries are always positive. But even now with COVID, we have to consider our personal physical boundaries on what we feel safe with, with our social distancing level, especially since the information we're getting changes, the people that maybe our loved ones or other people in our lives, we may very much wanna see, but they may not view the social distancing level the same way you do. So you really need to take some precautions there. Um, thinking about boundaries in other ways too, social media, the news, and really, if you find that it's starting to really affect you, or even if you see it on some level that it upsets you quite a bit, how to reduce down, how to limit yourself so you aren't exposed to this at the level that is available. Because it doesn't matter where you turn, it's your computer, it's the TV, it's any kind of social media, it's there. Um, and everybody's take on it. So being able to pay attention to that, to pay attention to our social distancing and just our relationships. Are we surrounding ourselves with healthy people? And even if we're isolated, can we still connect with people who we feel who we feel safe with? Discovering. This is about discovering and understanding your triggers, but understanding the things that make you feel better. I, I've talked to lots of people where that's half the battle. I don't know what I like to do. I don't know what calms me down. You know, they don't. They don't have that clarity and that's okay. But part of this is an opportunity to discover what is it that I can do that actually makes me feel better. And I'd, I'd really um, encourage you to give it a chance. Just because it didn't work out one time doesn't mean the next time you do it, it isn't gonna be a positive thing. And sometimes it takes time. I like this picture just because it, it kind of brings you out into the um, forest in the wilderness, and I, I find that to be a really soothing place. The other piece of this is now looking at, thinking about whatever those things are, self-care, and how to make it routine. 
you know, um, Renee mentioned this before and how we lose control with everything that's gone on with COVID and the unpredictability and the doubt and the unknowns. Developing routine and ritual, um, even if you're not sure how to do that, you just start small and you just try to create that schedule, even if it's one thing at a time might be hard if you have lots of people at home, but you've got to just carve out a little pocket of time, whether it's um, getting out, if you're able, um, cooking, gardening, whatever it is that you're, what, you know, how you can discover to be your thing to increase self-care. And, and give yourself permission that it's okay to relax. A lot of us um, have grown up or have never felt that that's something that we have permission to do. And really give yourself permission to do that. How are we? And we're, we're close. So these are a few extra um, kind of options for you guys that just to know it's available is right here with Tri-C. We do have in our counseling department, we're both from the counseling department and the counseling department does have mental health therapists that you can call even though right now it's it's going to be you know by phone or webex um but you can tap into our services um and also i want to mention that there's definitely counseling in the community if that's an interest other community resources um i wanted just to kind of plug in here the help is here which has a lot of great resources for um just supportive things that you could tap into that I'll just touch on. And the SAMHSA, this disaster um, distress helpline is a 1-800 number if you need to talk to someone any time of day. So there's a phone and there's a text number, 66746. And then this, I just kind of um, copied a page of this Help Is Here site. I have the link here on the bottom, but it has a whole host of mental health and wellness op, um, options and articles to look at videos as well. And let me see if I could do this. I might have to kind of add another screen here to kind of show you this if this if this doesn't make it accessible for you. And you can tell me if you guys see this or not. No, no seen it. Okay, then let's I'm, I'm going to. See if you share my screen. Um, well, um, can you see it now or no? No? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so on this screen, I'm just pointing this out to, to highlight, there's lots of great things in here, like self assessments for anxiety, depression, and there's other useful sites. I'm not going to focus on with our time going to the mental health and wellness screen has a whole bunch of on the right side, a talk 24 seven help. And then you will see down here helpful resources for mental health, anxiety, substance use, depression. I just want to highlight right here two things. Um, there's guided imagery, meditation, but the guided imagery I just want to point out to you is awesome. It's a, a free site that let's say you just want to test out a one minute, two minute little meditation. You can just click on this and it'll start right up. And then you could do a meditation, a guided uh, visualization, and it has a host of these that you can investigate, see if it's something that would speak to you, okay? And then I just wanna point out the breathing because breathing is essential when we're feeling anxiety and stress. And if you scroll down, you're gonna see a host of different ways to breathe. You may not think breathing needs a whole bunch of different <laughs> ways to learn how to breathe, but Breathing can be an art on some level and definitely would encourage anyone as you are learning to practice when you're not feeling stressed at that moment. Try to start something little like this and making this a part of your routine. It, it's a really awesome resource. And then let's see if I can find my way back to our screen, but maybe I can't. Let's get here. This just showing you how to find counseling at Tri-C, how to find our website. You will see um, these are individual phone numbers per campus. Um, and you, when you go to this site, you will also see some emails if you would like to email um, anyone at Tri-C. 
So I think that's the last one. This is actually some other resources on um, taking care of your mental health for you to peruse on different links, whether it be a chat line, a hotline, or other useful services that may help mental health wise to support you. Um, I think one thing just to wrap up here is to really convey to you guys that um, whatever stress you're feeling, which is very normal in this abnormal situation, um, <clears throat> how to notice it, how to pay attention to it, how to notice what your, what, what, how it plays out for you, what it looks like for you, and how to um, develop some useful tools so that you can take care of yourself and just notice like how it it's affecting other things and bleeds into other parts of your life when we understand the brain but understanding ways that we can catch it you can catch it when it's smaller and you can take care of ways to relax to feel more um, to feel less stress to have a different outlook on things um any other last comments renee just to keep in mind that, um, you know, other COVID is a huge thing affecting all of us, um, but having, again, those underlying uh, stresses or, or issues. And for people who are also experiencing the impacts of all of the events that have been happening in the last month um, and are impacted um, by the racial unrest and tension, this is not just current, but is ongoing and, and just sort of, uh, brought to the forefront with the recent events that, that the impact of and stress is going to be exponentially high. So um, take good care of yourself. And thank you. Well, thank you both so much for such an informative and obviously timely presentation. I um, took some notes myself, so I really appreciate, I really appreciate this. And I, I also appreciate everyone for engaging in the chat. Um, we had some responses to some of the things you were saying, which um, really related with some people. So that's great. Um, so again, thank you so much for your time, Sue and Renee. Um, they can be contacted through our counseling department. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that is it for this session. Um, the last and final session of the day starts right now in um, a separate room. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, and that is tips that you bought or that you you want you to have to impress your boss. Sorry, it was off the top of my head. So that's a good one for everyone. But thanks so much, everyone. And I hope you have a great day and enjoy the rest of Success Week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Did we not answer the rest of the text? Oh, she did. We're good. They're all they're answered. So <laughs> are we are we off? <laughs>